In an ethical debate with another person, you may have heard someone say something like the following. You know, that's just your opinion, or everyone is entitled to their own opinion. Maybe you yourself have said these things. Often it's said as a way of deflecting away from someone's argument or trying to undermine their ability to speak authoritatively on the topic at hand. But what do we really mean when we say things like that? These sorts of statements, like everyone's entitled to their own opinion, seem to imply that any answer we give to an ethical question is just as good as another. But do we really mean that in ethics there's a sort of anything-goes attitude? Is any answer we give really just as good as another? When we say these things, do we mean that our beliefs about controversial ethical questions like abortion, the death penalty, and immigration are just like the preferences we have for our favorite ice cream flavors? Is it really the case that we can never be wrong about what we think about ethics and morality? Ultimately, if statements like these imply a fundamentally relativistic attitude about ethics, then it is not clear why we should take ethics seriously. Think about this. Why should we bother discussing important ethical questions if there isn't a right answer? Or even not even going to the level of a right answer if there can't even be a wrong answer? If nobody can be right, and nobody can be wrong, then what is it we're just trying to discover? What are we discussing? What is the point of any conversation of this sort about an ethical or moral or political matter? Now, given the serious implications that this relativistic attitude has for ethics, and the seeming ease and ubiquity which, with which these statements are expressed, I think we should think more carefully about what statements like everyone is entitled to their own opinion actually means. In this video, we're going to consider the relativistic position that's sometimes associated with these statements, and we're going to ask ourselves about whether that relativistic attitude, that relativistic viewpoint, whether it really treats ethics with the amount of seriousness that it deserves. Thus far, I've suggested that the relativistic attitude often associated with statements like everyone is entitled to their own opinion simply fails to take ethics seriously. But I think before we can really understand and evaluate that claim, we first need to ask a broader question. What does it mean to take ethics seriously in the first place? For the person who is committed to taking ethics seriously, and wants to give moral questions their proper attention that they respect and deserve, what kinds of commitments will that person have? Now, the author of our textbook, Lisa Newton, suggests two specific commitments that she thinks are integral to taking ethics seriously. On the one hand, there is the commitment to reason, and on the other hand, there is the commitment to objectivity and impartiality. She says both of these are demanded of anyone who would take ethics seriously, and they constitute what is known as the moral point of view. Now, most of this video is going to be spent on covering the commitment to reason, but I want to begin first by saying a few things about the commitment to objectivity and impartiality, because it's also a very crucial aspect of the vantage point from which we make ethical and moral judgments. So Newton goes on to describe a little bit about what this commitment to objectivity and impartiality is. And there's really two claims to make here. First, she says, we have an obligation to examine the options from an objective standpoint, a standpoint that everybody could ado adopt without partiality. She goes on to say that it's a standpoint in which we take into consideration all the stakeholders, Right, so when you're making an ethical decision, you ask yourself, not just how is this going to affect me or my friends or my family or even the people in my state, city, town. You're asking yourself the question, how will this influence or affect everyone who has a stake in my decision? Everybody who could be affected by that decision. And if you're really taking a, 
taking an objective or impartial point of view, then that means all those stakeholders need to be given equal consideration. Newton explains the commitment to the moral point of view entails a willingness to give equal consideration to the rights, interests, and choices of all parties to the situation in question. Now, the first question you might ask yourself here is, well, why should I think that this is a point of view I should adopt? It's certainly not a natural point of view. Our natural point of view, well, maybe first and foremost, is one that gives priority to our own interests. Then maybe the interests of our family and our friends and people who live near us. In fact, our natural emotions and our natural care and concern is most likely going to be taken up or is going to be uh, engendered by those that we know the best. So we might wonder why do we have to think it's important to take an objective or impartial stance? Why do we have to care just as much about those who we know as those who we don't know? Well, this is a complicated question, but Newton gives some indication as to why this is an important aspect of ethics. She says, we also know that if anyone's wants, needs, votes, or choices are to be taken seriously and weighed in the final balance, then everyone's wants of that type must be weighed in equally. If anyone is to be accorded respect and moral consideration, then all must be. The idea of objectivity and impartiality comes from an idea of the fundamental equality of humans. It comes from the idea that no one person is special or more important than another. So if anybody's interests matter, if my interests matter, right, when I'm making a decision, if I have to think about my happiness, then it also follows I have to think about the happiness of other people as well. Because I'm not special, I don't get a special status or privilege, and I can't say that my concerns are more important than the concerns of everyone else. So what underlies this commitment to impartiality and objectivity is a fundamental commitment to fairness and equality. If any way, the way to think about it is, for Newton, if you're going to take ethics seriously, then you have to think ethics isn't just about getting what I want. It's not just about making sure that those people I like and know and live around and have a relationship. It's not just about them getting what they want. It's about everyone whose interests can be affected by my action. It's about making sure that everyone's interests are taken into account and that I make that judgment in an impartial and objective way. And in fact, this commitment to impartiality and objectivity can be seen in one of the most famous ethical rules, the Golden Rule. And the Golden Rule can be found in many ethical traditions, many religious traditions, but one classic statement of it is found in the Bible in the words of Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount. What does Jesus say? He says, do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the Law and the Prophets. Now think about that statement, do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. How does this work? How does this idea work? Well, it says, look, you know what a way in which you would like to be treated. You understand the rights you think you deserve. And you also know the way in which you would not like to be treated. You know what it means to suffer disrespect, to suffer indignity, to suffer harm. You understand all that from your personal point of view. So then the question is, how do we act ethically? How do we act in our relations toward other people? Well, if you accept all that I just said, along with the claim, again, that you are not special, that you don't have a special status above others, that all human beings are equal, if you accept those two claims, then it does seem in a straightforward way that whatever way you think would be acceptable for you to be treated, others should be treated in that way as well. The very essence of the golden rule is this idea of impartiality and objectivity and placing your own interests on equal footing with the interests of others. And of course, in this statement, not only does Jesus here in the, sta in the Sermon on the Mount um, give the general formulation of the golden rule, but he also says this is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. 
And here's a specific reference to many of the rules in the Ten Commandments. And of course, these will be familiar. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you should not steal, you should not bear false witness or lie. These are also very common ethical rules. And so what is being said here? Well, the claim is that from this general principle, the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, we can get more specific, more particular uh, ethical rules. If you wouldn't want to be lied to, you shouldn't lie to others. If you wouldn't want to be murdered, then you shouldn't murder other people. The same with stealing, etc., etc. So the golden rule takes this abstract commitment to impartiality and actually gives us a way of generating many more particular ethical rules. And it is also a way in which we see manifest the very fundamental importance that the commitment to objectivity and impartiality has for ethical decision making. The moral point of view, which just is the point of view that someone who takes ethics seriously must adopt, is comprised of two commitments. We've now discussed the commitment to objectivity and impartiality, so now let's say a few things about the commitment to reason. Newton describes this commitment in the following way. She says, in any troubling case, we have first of all an obligation to think about it, to examine all the options available to us. And of course, this itself is a significant statement, because even if you put ethics aside for a moment, think about how much of our decision-making sometimes is driven by non-rational factors. Well, we've always done it this way in the past, or doing it this way feels good, or I just sort of have an impulse, an immediate impulse to want to make this decision. And the idea is that if we're going to take ethics seriously, then when we confront a difficult ethical issue, It's not enough to just say, this is how we've always done it, or this is what I feel is correct. We actually have to think about all the options in front of us and think about them carefully. Newton points out that when we have a commitment to reason, we don't act out of prejudice or impulse or do something just because we can, because we have the power to do so. When we have the commitment to reason, we say, I'm going to let my actions be guided by what my reason tells me is the best thing to do. And this means you have to be willing to subject, as Newton says, your own moral judgments, your own moral values to critical scrutiny. Not just say simply that, for instance, this is my opinion and I'm entitled to it. No, if you have a commitment to reason, you say, whatever my belief on this issue should be, it should be the one that is supported by the best arguments and the best reasons. Now, if we do have this commitment to reason, Newton also points out that this rules out a couple of things as possibilities for what could make our ethical decisions. On the one hand, later in this class, we're going to discuss an idea called intuitionism, and Newton argues that the commitment to reason means we cannot be intuitionists. And what is an intuitionist? What does that mean? It just means that you think moral judgment or deciding what's morally right or wrong is just simply a matter of pure intuition. It's your immediate feeling on the matter. You just have a sort of simple perception of what should be done that isn't open to, as Newton says, critical analysis. In order to better make this point, let's think about a concrete example. Previously in this class, we talked about the Vlasovic case. And here we had a situation where an individual's parent's mother was getting to a point in her life where she can no longer independently take care of herself. And because she was a fiercely independent person, and because she very much held on to her previous life where she had a higher degree of functioning in her mental faculties, she had brought up the possibility of intentionally ending her life prematurely. Now, of course, the question of euthanasia or physician-assisted suicide and suicide in general, those are all difficult ethical questions and questions on which uh, uh, good-hearted, honest people can disagree with a variety of different arguments. But the only point I want to make is this. That sort of case which touches on issues of life and death is one that is very apt to arise strong feelings in us. 
You might look at that case and say, well, no, of course, it's always wrong to take an innocent life and just have an immediate overwhelming feeling that doing that is always necessarily wrong. And maybe it is wrong. Maybe it is always wrong to take an innocent life. But the point we're getting at currently is the following. If you take ethics seriously, it will not be enough to say that it is wrong simply because you have this immediate intuition or immediate feeling it's wrong. In order to make the claim it's wrong, you have to make an argument for that claim. You have to give reasons for that claim. You have to think about the other options. You have to think about opposing points of view. It isn't simply enough to say this is the correct course of action because it immediately appears to you to be the correct course of action. As Newton says, you have to think about it. You have to subject those opinions to critical scrutiny. So the commitment to reason rules out intuitionism. It also rules out dogmatism, which Newton describes as an insistence that all moral disagreements are resolved by some preferred set of rules or doctrines, that inside that set there is nothing that can be questioned, and outside that set, there's nothing of any moral worth. If you are a dogmatist, you say, I have certain ethical principles, certain rules, and no matter what, these rules must be correct. There's no point in thinking about them. I know a priori or prior to having the discussion that they're absolutely true, and there's nothing you could possibly say to me to sway me from my opinion. So let's consider another example. Suppose you were thinking about the question, is it ever morally acceptable to tell a lie? And you think about a case in which telling a lie would save someone a lot of grief, save another person a lot of uh, harm or physical or mental suffering. And someone poses this question and another person says, well, no, um, it is absolutely wrong to tell a lie because in the Ten Commandments it says you should never tell a lie. Now again, maybe that's true. Maybe the view expressed in the Ten Commandments is correct. Maybe it is always wrong to tell a lie. But again, the point is just this. If we have a commitment to reason in ethical matters, then we can't simply appeal to some source of authority and say our work is done. We actually have to reason through and think about why is it always morally wrong to lie? We have to think about the opposing arguments, take them into serious consideration, and give reasons for why those arguments are inadequate. Notice previously I was talking about the Ten Commandments and the Golden Rule. And I said the commandments in the Ten Commandments um, can, hypothetically, be derived from the Golden Rule. Now why does that matter? Well, even there, the Ten Commandments is an authoritative set of rules in Christianity and, and also Judaism taken to be authoritative on matters of ethics. But even there, I was saying, look, let's think about the fundamental basis for those rules. Let's think about why we should think those rules are correct. And if that's what you're doing, you're not acting as a dogmatist. A dogmatist isn't necessarily someone who uphold a certain set of principles. A dogmatist is someone who refuses to think about them. But if you think the morality in the Ten Commandments and the view it expresses on lying is correct, and you're willing to think about why it's correct and give reasons in defense of your position, then you're not a dogmatist. You're simply someone engaging in ethical discourse. The dogmatist, on the other hand, would refuse to hear any countervailing arguments, refuse to hear any other positions, and simply remain secure in their already established belief that their preferred principles or doctrines must absolutely be correct. But both dogmatism and intuitionism go against the commitment to reason, and therefore also are counter or contrary to the moral point of view. We have seen that the moral point of view is one that includes strong commitments both to reason and to objectivity and impartiality. I've also suggested that when we make statements like everyone is entitled to their own opinion or that's just your opinion, that we are dangerously close to not taking ethics very seriously to really violating the commitments of that moral point of view. But in order to understand why this is, we need to understand 
why I've been saying that a statement like everyone is entitled to their own opinion expresses a relativistic position on ethics. And of course, that requires knowing, well, what exactly is relativism? And here I want to start with the following question. Are there objective ethical standards? And here there are really two choices. On the one hand, you could be an ethical objectivist, or you could be an ethical relativist. An ethical objectivist is someone who thinks there are ethical standards of rightness and wrongness, and these are true no matter what anyone thinks about them. And there are many different kinds of ethical objectivists, and they disagree with one another. Some people think that ethics and morality comes from God. Others say ethics is about increasing the greatest happiness for the greatest number or acting on universalizable principles. All of those are different forms of, of objectivism. They have very different views about what ethics is, but they all agree that there are standards outside of us that determine what is right and wrong. But ethical relativism would reject all those positions. And that's because the relativist thinks there are no objective standards. Every single ethical standard depends on what some individual person or group of persons thinks about that standard. Newton explains relativism in the following way. Relativism denotes any approach to ethics which holds that there are no absolute moral principles. The rules that govern each situation are to be determined by their relation to something else the customs or culture of the country, for instance, or the desires of the participants. So if you're a relativist, you say, well, yeah, maybe, um, you know, the idea that we shouldn't lie, maybe that could be good for one person, but not another. Maybe that's true for certain groups of people, but not other groups of people. Because if, if you're a relativist, then that means you think the ethics of lying or stealing or even killing is all relative to the opinions of some person or group of persons. And of course, this is where we get the relativist attitude that is expressed in the claim that that's just your opinion. Because if you're having an ethical conversation about abortion or the death penalty, and someone says, well, that's just your opinion, well, what is it they're saying? They seem to be saying something like, well, that might be true for you, but it's not necessarily true for me. Or even stronger, if you say everyone is entitled to their own opinion, it seems to say anyone can believe whatever they want about ethics. There is no objective truth. We all make our own rules. We're all entitled to our own opinion. And while, as I said, this is a statement that comes up often in contemporary ethical and political discourse, the attitude that's being expressed here is a very old one. In fact, the ancient Greek philosopher Protagoras famously said, man is the measure of all things. Now, what is the meaning of this statement? Well, it's a very sort of relativistic attitude once again. If we want to know whether something is morally good or bad, we want to know whether it's true that we should or shouldn't do something. The Protagoras is saying, don't try to discover objective moral principles that apply to everyone. Man is the measure of all things, and specifically our beliefs and opinions. If you think it's morally acceptable to lie, then according to a relativist account, it would be for you. If a group of people has decided it's not acceptable to lie, then for them, it isn't acceptable to lie. There are no objective standards. Man is the measure of all things. Human opinion is what determines what's morally right and wrong. Now, not all relativists are the same. In fact, different kinds of relativism can be distinguished by whether... Now, although all relativists are united in rejecting objective moral standards, not all relativists are the same. Different kinds of relativists can be distinguished based on what person or group of persons they think it is that determines what's morally right and wrong. For instance, you could have a cultural ethical relativism. 
If you're a cultural ethical relativist, then you think ethical rightness and wrongness is determined for each person by the standards of the culture in which they live. And this could also even depend further upon how you define a culture. Is a culture in your neighborhood? Is a culture in your country or the political organization you live in? Is it your religion? Is it some other sort of social organization? So there's a lot of details to be worked out. But in general, cultural ethical relativists hold that ethical standards come from some larger group we are a part of, and apparently whatever is the abiding belief of that group determines what is morally right and morally wrong. However, in this video I'm going to put more emphasis on a different kind of ethical relativism, which we'll call subjective ethical relativism or subjectivism. Now what is subjectivism? As Newton describes, subjectivism insists that the sole source of knowledge or authority is in the perception of the individual. Each person is his own authority on the moral life. So whereas the cultural relativist says, well, the culture determines the standards of ethics, the subjectivist says, no, you determine the standards of ethics. But you don't determine them for everyone universally or objectively. You determine them for yourself. And so does everybody else. There is no external truth or standard. Each individual person decides what's right and wrong. And whatever they decide, that is what's right or wrong for them. Now, one very important point to make about subjectivism is that it really eliminates any need to justify yourself and what you believe. Right? I've mentioned a number of times the example of should you ever tell a lie, and there can be always cases where it seems like it would reduce suffering and increase happiness to tell a lie. And many philosophers have spilled a lot of ink and typed a lot of words trying to answer that question, is it ever acceptable to tell a lie? But if subjectivism is correct, then that was all a waste of time. Because if subjective, subjectivism is correct, then nobody outside of your own individual conscience and your individual belief can ever know what's right or wrong. There's no need to explain your belief or justify your decisions. Because when you give a reason for a position you hold, when you say it's always morally wrong to lie for this reason, you're implying it's not just a reason for you, it's a reason other people should listen to. It's a reason that holds for other people as well. But if subjectivism is true and there are no external standards, then why do I need to care about the reasons other people could give? Why do I need to find out or attempt to find out what the truth about morality is when there is no truth with a capital T about morality? If subjectivism is true, there's no need to justify what we believe. There's no need to argue about what's correct. There's no reason to give reasons for what we think about ethics. In fact, there's no real reason to have conversation about ethics at all. There is no truth we're talking about. There are no higher moral principles. All there are are individuals making their own decisions and essentially writing their own ethical rules. And so for that reason, not only is there no need to talk about ethics, there's no need to justify your decisions. As Newton points out, there's no need to study ethics. In fact, if in fact subjectivism is correct, then this class truly would be pointless insofar as we are engaged in a rational discussion or rational inquiry about what should we think about morality and ethics. But subjectivism would completely undermine all of that. With these points in place, we can now see why subjectivism and really relativism in general would undermine or go against the moral point of view. Newton makes the following points about subjectivism. It's a position that is anti-reason. Again, you don't need to subject your own opinions to criticism. You don't need to listen to the criticisms of others because there is no truth to discover through philosophical discussion of ethical matters. It's also extremely dogmatic. On the areas of morality that affect me, Newton explains, my opinions constitute an absolute and final authority not to be questioned by others. Whatever you, if subjectivism is true, whatever you believe about ethics is the final authority. You can be completely dogmatic about whatever it is you think about ethics without ever having to be questioned. 
And if you put those two things together, being anti-reason and dogmatic, then of course subjectivism violates the commitment to reason. And if it violates the commitment to reason, then that also means subjectivism violates the moral point of view. And if it violates the moral point of view, then we have to conclude that subjectivism is not a position which takes ethics seriously. As we just said, it eliminates the need to study ethics. It eliminates the need for any philosophical discourse about ethics. And as such, subjectivism, if the moral point of view does include the commitment to reason, really can't be seen as a serious competitor for viewpoints about how to live a good and morally correct and ethical life. We now have a better sense of what subjectivism is, as well as a better sense of why it undermines our commitment to reason and our commitment to the moral point of view. But suppose you encountered a committed subjectivist who understood all those points but said, so what? I understand that subjectivism violates what you're calling the moral point of view, but that's not very important to me. Um, I'm perfectly fine thinking that I can make my own moral rules. Well, how might we argue against this person? How might we point out errors in their way of thinking how can we provide an argument against the soundness of subjectivism? In our textbook, our author Lisa Newton makes really two different kinds of criticisms against subjectivism that I want to take a look at here. So the first one has to do with what I'm going to call sort of slippage between what you have a legal right to do and what qualifies as a moral truth. So Newton explains this point in the following way. She says, we make a very large mistake when we confuse a constitutionally guaranteed right with the moral category of rightness. There is no logical connection between what you have a right to do and the right thing to do, even though there's a psychological temptation to move from one to the other. So what does she mean here? Well, first we have to understand that I think the fact that we live in a modern liberal democracy is an extremely important point here. We live in a society which is based on the idea of individual rights, which has a bill of rights, in which the value of freedom of speech is very important, and in which we think that all citizens have a, not only the right, but perhaps even the duty to think through to themselves what they think is correct about ethics and politics, and to express that freely. So even if we disagree with someone, even if we think they're very wrong-headed in their view of abortion or euthanasia or immigration or any other contentious moral and political issue, there is a duty to allow them to speak their mind and to follow their conscience. And of course, this is very important. It's a bedrock of a, of a proper and functioning, open, democratic society. However, I think we underestimate sometimes the extent to which Living in this sort of society, which is really quite new in human history, has a serious psychological effect on us. I think in some way the fact that we do live in a society which values freedom of thought and expression makes it very easy to think that, well, if everyone is allowed to express themselves, and if we have to tolerate and accept other people's expressions of what they believe about the world, then everybody must be right. Or to put it another way, maybe, nobody could be wrong. There's a temptation, as Newton points out, to slip from, I have a legal right to say X or believe X, to the claim that, well, therefore, X must be true. But of course, there isn't actually a connection between these two things. The fact that you have a right to think what you like doesn't mean that anything you happen to like to think is right. And to make this point, Newton gives the following example. Right, you have all the right in the world, she says, to think that 2 plus 2 equals 5. You can go around advocating for this position. You can put out posters, petitions, and flyers to try to convince your fellow citizens that 2 plus 2 equals 5. And no one can punish you or put you in jail for thinking that is the case. But of course, that doesn't mean it's actually correct. Just because you believe 2 plus 2 equals 5, and you have the legal right to say that 2 plus 2 equals 5, doesn't change the actual facts of the matter. 
2 plus 2 equals 4. And if we can say that about mathematics, if we agree about that, then why can't we say the same thing about ethics? And we can sort of think about this as the following kind of argument. This is the faulty argument which seems to underline, uh, underlie relativism and subjectivism in particular. Citizens of a democratic society have the right to believe what they like about matters of ethical concern. You have a right to think what you like. Therefore, the conclusion is drawn that there are no objective standards of ethical correctness. Anything you happen to like is true. But what Newton is rejecting here is the movement from that premise to the conclusion. The fact that you have a right to think what you want about abortion or euthanasia or immigration or any other contentious ethical issue does not mean that whatever you think is true. Just like you have a right to think about whatever you want about triangles and squares and the number of sides they have and what 2 plus 2 equals, you can think whatever you want about that from a legal point of view. That doesn't mean you are correct. There are objective standards in mathematics that are not undermined just because people can express opinions that go against those objective standards. So if we can say that about, uh, about mathematics, then it seems we should say that this inference is also bad when it comes to ethics and morality as well. I now want to look at the second criticism that Newton makes of subjectivism. And I'm going to call this criticism the relativist dilemma. I call it this because it's a dilemma that comes about when you try to defend any sort of relativism, whether that be cultural relativism or subjectivism. So what's the basic idea here? Well, what you should do is imagine the following. Imagine that you encountered a subjectivist or a relativist, and you ask that person to defend their position, to defend their subjectivist or relativist view of ethics. How would the relativist do that? Well, the dilemma that is supposed to come about when you ask this question can be expressed in the following argument. The first premise of this argument is the following. Premise one, the relativist can either defend their relativism by appealing to some other set of ethical values, like toleration or respect for conscience, or the relativist cannot appeal to any other set of ethical values when defending relativism. So the basic idea behind the fundamental claim of the argument is this. If you ask a relativist to defend their position, they can either say, look, relativism is good and true because of these other important values, or they can just point to no other important values at all. So we're going to consider each of these two possibilities. And let's begin by considering the first possibility. Let's begin by considering the possibility that the relativist defends their relativism by pointing to some other set of ethical values. So what would this look like? The relativist might say, look, relativism is good and important because it's wrong to not tolerate other points of view. Or it is important that we're relativists so that other people can't impose their viewpoint on us. Or it's impossible to protect freedom of speech and freedom of conscience if we're not ethical relativists. Now you might take issue with all those claims, but here's the important thing to notice, and here's what P2 says. If the relativist defends their relativism in that way by appealing to some other ethical value, then they are no longer a consistent relativist. They are no longer a relativist at all. Because as Newton points out, if they are appealing to some other set of values like respect for conscience or freedom of expression, or toleration and pluralism, then that means they seem to think that those are objective values. Those are values that other people should accept. They're not just their own values. They're saying that, look, toleration and respect for conscience is not just a rule or a, an important value that I'm making for myself. It's an important value for everyone. It's one that should convince you as well. But if they're saying that, then they don't really think all values are relative. They don't just think they get to make up their own moral rules. They are saying there are moral rules that other people have to follow as well. And of course, that goes against the subjectivist or relativist viewpoint in which all moral rules, all moral and ethical values are always relative to the individual or group who is making the moral rules or deciding what values are important. 
So the first uh, point here is if, is if we take the option where the relativist appeals to some other set of values, they simply are no longer a consistent relativist. So now let's consider the second option in the dilemma. Consider the option where the relativist remains consistent. They don't attempt to defend relativism by appealing to some larger objective or universal set of values. They simply stick to their guns, say there are no objective values, and everyone gets to make their own rules. What the argument claims now is that if the relativist does this, then it's not clear they have any reason to support relativism. It's not clear that there's any advantage to be gained or there's any good reason to think that this is a good or proper moral outlook. And the reason for this is the following. If you had to pick out the primary reason why it is that relativism would have any attractiveness, it is because we do have some squeamishness, we do have some reticence to th when we think about imposing values on other people. People's lives are very complicated, we're all in different situations, we all have different cultural backgrounds and belief systems, and you might say, well, where does anyone get the right to say someone is wrong or impose their values on others? And of course, as, again, as citizens of modern liberal democracies, we are very wary of authoritarian attempts to impose values on other people. So this seems to be one of the fundamental motivations of relativism. Okay, so if that is the, one of the fundamental motivations of relativism, can we uphold that if we're consistent relativists? Imagine now that there is some authoritarian, totalitarian political regime that's attempting to force everyone to think a certain way about ethics, morals, and politics. What can the relativists say in response to that? Right? Well, it seems like not very much. Newton makes this point. She says, if I choose to be a consistent relativist, of course, then I have to renounce those and all other permanent moral principles. But then I have no right to object to your attempts or the moral majorities or Hitler's to impose values on me. If imposing values is one of the things you like to do or one of the things this totalitarian, authoritarian regime likes to do just because it feels good, then according to relativism, it's obviously right for you to impose values on me. The idea is that if you're really a consistent relativist, if everyone makes their own rules, how can you object when someone uses their power to impose values on you? Newton continues, if I try to be a consistent relativist, I lose all purchase on the field of ethics, including the right to resist the tyrant's imposition of values, which was the purpose for which I first advanced subjective relativism. I think this point shows the fundamental error in the relativist way of thinking. It's common to think that it's a tolerant or accepting or pluralistic point of view. But in fact, if relativism is true, then we really have no warrant or justification um, or reason for resisting attempts to impose values. If what's important is making sure values are not imposed upon people, it turns out that must be a universal and objective value. And to the extent to which relativism gets rid of all universal and objective values, it simply cannot resist those sorts of attempts. And for that reason, it just doesn't seem like there's any longer a reason to be a relativist. So we see in the conclusion of the argument, neither of these options seem that great. Either in the process of defending relativism, the relativists must contradict themselves and cease to be consistent, or they must cease to have any good justifiable reason for supporting relativism in the first place. In this video, I've covered a number of criticisms of subjectivism and relativism, and we've seen a number of reasons to think that the subjectivist or relativist, instead of being tolerant or accepting, really just fails to take ethics seriously. I think all these are valid criticisms. But there's another point about subjectivism and relativism that I don't see mentioned as often. And to make this point, I want to go to one of my favorite passages from the 18th century philosopher David Hume in his famous work, The Inquiry Concerning the Principles of Morals. 
In the conclusion to that work, he says the following. What wonder, then, that moral sentiments are found of such influence in life? These principles, we must remark, are social and universal. They form, in a manner, the party of humankind against vice or disorder, its common enemy. Now, what is Hume saying here? He's saying that our moral feelings, the moral evaluations or judgments we, we, that we make about what's good or bad or right and wrong, they form a sort of common human identity. These things tie us all together as a species, right? Our common distaste for dishonesty and injustice and cruelty and our love of benevolence and affection and kindness and justice. All these things tie us together, as he says, the party of humankind. They unite us against vice and disorder. One of the reasons I like this passage so much is because on the one hand, it's actually very striking and maybe counterintuitive. When we think about ethics and morals, it's very easy to focus on cases where we disagree. Again, the examples of abortion and euthanasia and any other and the death penalty and then the other contentious ethical issue in society. It's easy to think about ethics and morality and use those kinds of cases as a synonym for what ethics and morality is all about. Ethics and morality is about contentious issues which cause us to fight, which are divisive and divide us. But here Hume says that morality is actually something that can unite us. It can form the basis for a common human identity. And it's interesting to think why he would say that. And I think to a large extent, to understand Hume's point, maybe when we think about ethics and morality, we should accept that there are issues that divide us, of course, and will lead to heated disagreement. But on the other hand, I think more fundamentally, maybe the paradigmatic example of what ethics and morality is all about is when we see someone being cruel or unjust, and we are all united in our opposition to that individual. When we see someone inflicting suffering on another person for no reason, you can think of the bully here. Think of how the sort of resentment and the ind indignation and and blame that we lay upon that person. And think about how you can expect that other people are going to mirror your feelings and reflect what you're feeling as well. I think that's what Hume is getting at here. There's a fundamental sense in which morality ties the human species together in an identity that transcends our mere biological sameness or the, the DNA structure that we share. There's something more deep, uh, there's something deeper that ties us all together. Now, I bring this up because it lets me make one last point about subjectivism. If subjectivism is true, then all of that is undermined. What ethics is really about is each individual expressing their own particular view of ethics. And if that's true, then whatever advantages come from this party of humankind where we're all united by our judgments of virtue and vice, and we're all united against cruelty and injustice, that's all gone. That's wiped away. There is no party of humankind. There's a party of you and your individual feelings as narcissistic or limited a vantage point as they might come from or they might be. And I think that would be a real shame. I think there's a sense in which morality should help us form an identity. I think it would be great if morality helped us form a human identity, made us feel closer to our peers, made us feel closer to other people. But insofar as subjectivism eradicates the basis for any objective or universal moral values, it also eliminates that possibility of a true human identity. And to that extent, I think it is a position that is to be lamented and ultimately to be rejected.